Welcome to the Megacast, our live local daily TV, radio, and streaming show looking into all things Michigan. I'm Tyler Keeft. Today we'll be talking to a number of people about topics of interest and importance to Michiganders just like you. And let's begin with what's making headlines today on our website, civiccentertv.com, on our local news page. Our top article comes from Paula Gardner at Bridge, Michigan. Michigan homeowners and developers are preparing themselves for some lighter pockets following the recent, once again, historic interest rate by a uh, rate hike by the Federal Reserve for an unprecedented fourth consecutive month a uh, fourth consecutive time. The Federal Reserve chose to raise the interest rate by 0.75 percent in attempt to balance out the economic impacts of rising inflation rates. When uh, when it comes to homeowners, the rate hike means some stark differences. For example, as was given in this article from Paula Gardner, with a 3.24 percent interest rate, a 30 year mortgage with a homeowner looking to finance $100,000 and put 20% down on their purchase, they would pay a mortgage of about $347 per month. After Wednesday's hike, which now makes the interest rate 7.24%, that monthly cost would then go up to $545. What that means for sellers is less interest in the buyer's market due to higher costs, making for lower demand, and therefore they need to consider selling their property at lower prices in order to remain competitive in the real estate market. Really interesting stuff uh, and, and even more extensive look into how the, the recent uh, Federal Reserve interest rate hike will affect Michiganders specifically in this article from Bridge, Michigan on our website, civiccentertv.com on our local news page. Also making headlines today on that same page from the Detroit News is Kim Kozlowski. Michigan State University President Samuel Stanley will conclude his tenure as university president on Friday following the Board of Trustees naming of Teresa Woodruff earlier this week as the university's interim president. On his way out, President Stanley made the following statement saying, quote, one of the greatest privileges of my career serving as the president of Michigan State University will draw to a close on Friday. It has been an eventful three years since my arrival, thanks to the uh, commit commitment of our dedicated community of students, faculty, academic staff, support staff, and alums. We safely navigated through the COVID-19 pandemic, grew enrollment in a difficult environment, rose in national and international rankings, set fundraising records, and developed three strategic plans that will serve as blueprints for the future. And together, we put the goal of having a safe, welcoming, diverse, and inclusive campus foremost, creating a firm foundation for continued excellence at Michigan State University. Stanley announced his official intent to resign on October 13th of this year, stating a loss of confidence in the university's publicly elected board of trustees, providing his contractually obligated 90 days notice at that time. He was scheduled to exit shortly after the beginning of the year on January 11th of 2023, but his exit will exit his post early in order to make room for the entrance of interim president Woodruff saying, quote, thank you, students, faculty, staff, alumni, donors, friends, and friends for the opportunity to be your president. The positive impact that MSU has on our region, state, country, and the entire world is truly remarkable. And you have my deepest admiration for the work that you do every day to make that happen. I will carry MSU with me wherever I go and closed quote. Finally, making headlines today on CivicCenterTV.com's local news page from the Detroit Free Press's Frank Witzel. Uh, at 2 a.m. on Sunday, daylight saving time will finally come to a close as we fall back one hour on the clock and get that extra bit of sleep before the Sunday scaries kick in. Uh, with the time change, a renewed debate once again on the validity of daylight saving time and whether or not this tradition should continue and whether or not it serves a viable purpose in uh, in the modern world. Since 2015, upwards of 350 bills have been introduced to state legislatures all across the country on this matter. In fact, last year, the Michigan House of Representatives passed a bill that would nix daylight saving time if, federal, if the federal Congress did the same. This particular proposal that was approved would move Michigan to a year-round daylight saving uh, time, or as, as it currently stands, the spring clock times that we're, that we're in at this moment until Sunday at 2 a.m. If it's also approved uh, by other states in the Midwest region, including Wisconsin, Illinois, Indiana, Pennsylvania, and Ohio as well. 
More discussion on daylight saving in this article. Take a look on our website, civiccentertv.com, on our local news page. All of those headlines are on our website, civiccentertv.com, on our local news page, along with links to COVID-19 updates from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, and the Oakland County Health Division. We have a great show ahead on this Thursday edition of the MegaCast. Coming up next, we'll have our weekly mental health talk with the Birmingham Maple Clinic's Carrie Krawick. It is Caregivers Month here now that we are in the month of November, uh, National Family Caregivers Month. We'll talk about uh, caregivers in the sandwich generation, as it's known, uh, coming up next with Carrie Krawick from the Birmingham Maple Clinic. You're watching and listening to the MegaCast. Now that the vaccine is available for children five and up, why do you recommend it? kids are part of the community and they can spread COVID. We're seeing both healthy children getting sick from the virus as well as children with underlying health conditions. They can easily bring the virus home to other people that are vulnerable and make them sick as well. This vaccine can change that and keep children safe. It's essential that your children get vaccinated to protect them, to protect your families, and to protect those in the community around you. Let's whoop it up for these moments. Made possible by the COVID-19 vaccine. Keep the cheering going by keeping yourself protected and your COVID-19 vaccines up to date. Take a look back in time and recollect local history at this month's Sylvan Story presentation. Learn about Sylvan Lake's illustrious past from the lovely Helen Jane Peters as she discusses everything she can about Whitfield School's teacher and principal, Mr. Glenn Husted, and the letters he'd write to soldiers fighting in World War II. Sylvan Story, drop by at 6.30 p.m. Thursday, November 10th at the Sylvan Lake Community Center. Can I ask you a question? Uh, Why do you want to get the COVID-19 vaccine? I don't like getting sick. The virus will die. It will be easy to not catch it. Keep my family safe and keep playing soccer. Because I love being vaccinated. What's your hope for everyone? I hope everybody gets the vaccine. To keep safe and strong. Be like happy, having fun everywhere. Everyone stay safe and hope you get the vaccine. Let's savor these moments made possible by the COVID-19 vaccine. Keep the dining out going by keeping yourself protected and your COVID-19 vaccines up to date. Welcome back to the Megacast, our live local daily TV, radio, and streaming show about all things Michigan. I'm Tyler Keith. Learn more about our program on our website at civiccentertv.com slash megacast, where you'll find more information on all of our partnering stations across the Great Lakes State, including My Michigan TV. Joining us now on the program is a therapist at Birmingham Maple Clinic here in Oakland County. Carrie Craywick joins us for our weekly mental health talk on the Megacast. And Carrie, uh, thank you for joining us. It is National Family Caregivers Month, and, and this is a, a great time to recognize uh, the work that caregivers do in our local area, in the state of Michigan, across the, the country and the world to, to uh, care for their families, loved ones, and, and others as well. But, but that can also come with a significant toll mentally and, and certainly physically. Uh, as well on them as that's a lot of work and it's often under high stress for a variety of different reasons. Absolutely, there are 11, un, 11 million unpaid caregivers who are in what's called the sandwich generation. So those are the people that are caring both for their children who are younger than 18, while also caring for someone in their family, perhaps their parents that are older than 65. So they are right in the middle, probably in their 40s, um, probably also juggling their own work life and taking care of two generations of people. Yeah, we talked recently about parental burnout being uh, a big factor for parents as kids are back in school and 
uh, with modern constraints of parenting. And I would imagine, uh, given the fact that, as you said, so many of those in that sandwich generation that are parenting, but also caregiving, that that can also have uh, kind of compounding impacts from really both sides with the, the younger generation in their family and also their older generation of their family and kind of being wedged in between those two, taking care of everybody. Absolutely. People in that position that are taking care of both of those generations report a high a deal of high stress, um, as well as financial and physical stress. So um, they have little to no time to themselves. They're also managing family discord. If there are other adult siblings or people who have positions about how caregiving should be administered or who should be doing it or not doing it. Um, they're dealing with their cultural expectations, like what historically has been accepted of a person um, in a family with regards to caregiving um, and, and just the complex emotions of grieving, you know, their parents uh, changing abilities, um, you know, anxiety about how their kids are doing or performing socially. Um, so they're dealing with a lot of complex emotions. And I would imagine too, is it's 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 also really tough for them to decide on the priority there because there is so much to care for when you are a parent, and there is so much to consider too when you're a caregiver. And I would and and that's got to be an additional major stress on them to be making those decisions with very limited time, also having their own professional life, their personal life. Uh, in, in many cases, you know, their married life also a, a factor in all this. That's a lot to juggle and making those kinds of decisions on what is the priority between your kids and you know, your parents or another you know, more elderly member of your family or another member of your family that's just in, in need of some additional care. That can be a really tough decision and a really big burden to put on somebody. Absolutely. Well, plus, you know, there are relationships that maybe have been complex to begin with, and you may have at one point in your life sought your parent as a source of support for you. And now having to support them means you have one less person to turn to, um, to alleviate your own needs. And of course, talking to someone is one way to alleviate stress. Um, but people feel too, like maybe that person is no longer their person to turn to because of their own needs. Of course, you and I have talked so many times too about how um, the pandemic interplays in this, but also many things feel so much like life and death. So people feel a high degree of stress that they're making the wrong choices. You know, should I do this for my parents or should I not? Um, should I have contact with them? Should I not? When should I intervene? Um, and it feels very scary because the choices feel like, what if this is my last choice as it relates to my parents? And, and it feels very urgent and emergent all the time. We're joined by Carrie Kraywick, a therapist at the Birmingham Maple Clinic on today's edition of the MegaCast, our weekly mental health talk Thursdays, 10, 10 a.m. here on the MegaCast. More information can be found on BirminghamMaple.com. That's BirminghamMaple.com or visit CivicCenterTV.com slash MegaCast where you can watch back all of our more recent interviews with Carrie and the team at the Birmingham Maple Clinic. And uh, in terms of what caregivers can do to kind of take that step back, take that time for themselves, and most importantly, get that rest that they need from taking care of so many different people and so many different varieties and, and capacities that are required to be a, a caregiver in that sandwich generation, their parents, and, and also taking care of older uh, or sick individuals in, the, in their family. What suggestions do you have for steps that they can take, even if it's just for a few moments, a few minutes, here and there a few times a day to get that relaxation, that relief, and uh, you know, take some of that burden off their shoulders here and there. Sure. So I think, yeah, to deal with the stress that comes from having no time, no personal time and no respite, certainly um, taking some steps to use some time to plan and, and strategize and, and get organized. So kind of look at your time. How much time do you feel like you need to dedicate to each of these people? Can you kind of break it up into chunks or blocks? Look at your day and say, okay, my date needs this many minutes or hours dedicated to my children, this much to myself or my work, this much to my parent. And can you find a place for people and sort of keep them to some degree in the in the in this places you put them so you know I, I think of one family I'm aware of where her aging mother will call her during the middle of her work day and say I need this medicine or something Kleenex Benadryl whatever fill in the blank right now and it's like well okay I'll be there at this time to give you what you need um and so but and feeling that you know like you will address this person their needs will go, get met um, and, and just to keeping it in a little more organized way. 
certainly not being afraid to ask for help or, you know, you know, so if caregivers especially take a great deal of pride in being in that role. You know, they want to see themselves as able to take care of other people's needs and don't want them to see, feel as though they have needs themselves. Um, so, you know, being honest about the help you need and letting go of some things, it may not be done exactly the same way you would do it, but if it's done good enough and the person is safe and well and and fulfilled, then it's okay to let your spouse or a neighbor or some other person in the community um, step up. Um, certainly dealing with the family gets discord, you know, being honest about your feelings and your experiences, um, recognizing your resentment and being realistic. Of course, everybody has their own reasons and their own relationships with the, the person who needs care to, to make choices, making compromise as a family and understanding that there will, of course, be hurt feelings um, and, 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 and those will have to take time to heal um, as well. A Pew Research survey has revealed that 23% of adults are in that sandwich generation, uh, and uh, most of those that are in that 23% are in their 40s, that being 54% of those that are within that 23% of all adults in the sandwich generation are in their 40s, right in that kind of sweet spot between being a parent and being you know, uh, uh, still, you know, the, a kid of somebody that may be a little bit older and, and needs some care, or you know, your your uh, family, your siblings, or your extended family, may be in need of some care as well. And so, Carrie, if they're not taking that, those steps back, if these individuals are not listening to their bodies and giving themselves some relief and trying to, you know, take a little bit of that exhaustion away, or just just the stress of caring for so many people in so many different various capacities away, what are some of the lingering effects that could be had on them, especially mentally? Uh, of, of course, we, uh, as we mentioned, exhaustion, but even beyond that, if they're not sure. really taking that self-care step. Sure. I mean, I think they experience, like I said, a lot of things, racing thoughts, um, high amounts of anxiety, um, difficulty falling asleep, difficulty staying asleep, just a great deal of guilt. Um, in general, overwhelmed. I think anxiety is the predominant emotion. Uh, maybe at times they feel like a failure because, I mean, really what they're asking themselves to do or what's being asked of them is quite impossible and just can't be done. And so it feels, um, you know, they can be exceptionally hard on themselves. And again, also have that like really fearful, catastrophic black and white thinking. Like if I don't respond to this person, they could die or something like that. Um, and so I think certainly talking to people, sharing with someone what you're going through, um, groups, um, community groups, uh, therapy groups, or even individual therapy and in family therapy for, for the remaining members of your family to understand um, your, your role and how to problem solve it together um, would all be useful ways to relieve the stress and to problem solve and find ways to structure time, organize, set reasonable expectations for yourself and the people in your family um, to avoid just such a giant burden. November marks National Family Caregivers Month, uh, and uh, it's a great time to recognize those uh, those caregivers and families all across our local area, across the state of Michigan and around the U.S. and the world that are, are doing this work often, most often unpaid uh, for a, a parent, a sibling, someone else in their life that they, that they deeply care about, as well as, uh, and that's why they're called that sandwich generation also caring for their kids at the same exact time. And a lot of stresses can come from that. Carrie, uh, in, in terms of these sandwich generation parents, anything else that we haven't discussed on, on this matter that would be important for uh, those caregivers in particular, or, or even more so their families to consider uh, at this time as we rec recognize them this month during November and, and do our best to help them as well? Yeah, I would make the argument that there's probably a great deal number more than we're even including in our numbers. There are plenty of parents who are still taking care to some degree, either financially or emotionally, of their adult children. Um, and, and those would be children that wouldn't necessarily qualify in the sandwich generation and then also still taking care of their parents and or their aging partners. So there's still people in caregiving roles that are sandwiched between two generations, even if they aren't exactly the one as a child and one that's elderly. Um, and so there are many, I think there are many caregivers that are caring in multi-directional ways um, that are experiencing these feelings. Well, We'll take a break here on the MegaCast. On the other side, we will be joined by Dr. Tina Kerr of the Michigan Association of Superintendents and Administrators. We've got some recent test results that have come back. 
any different effects academically on students and on classrooms across the state of Michigan due to the COVID-19 pandemic. She'll join us next to talk about how superintendents on the local level and educators statewide are working to counteract some of those, some of those issues and uh, hopefully bring our classrooms a little bit back to that base level they were at pre-pandemic. That's coming up next. You're watching and listening to the Megacast. Let's relish these moments made possible by the COVID-19 vaccine. Keep the festivals going by keeping yourself protected and your COVID-19 vaccines up to date. This November, honor the many people who offer their lives for our freedom at the 2022 Heroes Appreciation Breakfast. Organizations, charities, and local residents are invited to celebrate the men and women that ensure our safety and security. Hear from guest speakers, live performances, and presentations from veterans, officers, and more. Save the date, November 8th, 9 to 10 30 a.m. at the new West Bloomfield Middle School. Call 248 451 1900 to register. In the face of COVID 19, staying healthy is important. And now the same is true as we face the flu. Influenza has the potential to infect millions, putting lives and the healthcare system at risk. Fortunately, it's easy to protect yourself. The flu vaccine is safe and effective, and with COVID-19 still spreading, it's essential. To see how you can hit this virus head on, visit michigan.gov flu. Now that the vaccine is available for children five and up, why do you recommend it? Kids are part of the community and they can spread COVID. We're seeing both healthy children getting sick from the virus as well as children with underlying health conditions. They can easily bring the virus home to other people that are vulnerable and make them sick as well. This vaccine can change that and keep children safe. It's essential that your children get vaccinated to protect them, to protect your families, and to protect those in the community around you. Let's whoop it up for these moments, made possible by the COVID-19 vaccine. Keep the cheering going by keeping yourself protected and your COVID-19 vaccines up to date. Take a look back in time and recollect local history at this month's Sylvan Story presentation. Learn about Sylvan Lake's illustrious past from the lovely Helen Jane Peters as she discusses everything she can about Whitfield School's teacher and principal, Mr. Glenn Husted, and the letters he'd write to soldiers fighting in World War II. Sylvan Story, drop by at 6.30 p.m. Thursday, November 10th at the Sylvan Lake Community Center. Can I ask you a question? Uh, Why do you want to get the COVID-19 vaccine? I don't like getting sick. The virus will die. It will be easy to not catch it. Keep my family safe and keep playing soccer. Because I love being vaccinated. What's your hope for everyone? I hope everybody gets the vaccine. To keep safe and strong. Be like happy, having fun everywhere. Everyone stay safe and hope you get the vaccine. Welcome back to the Megacast, our live local daily TV, radio, and streaming show about all things Michigan. I'm Tyler Keith. Learn more about the program by visiting civiccentertv.com slash megacast. We'll find information on all of our partnering stations across the state and find all of our full shows and individual interviews on demand. Again, the website civiccentertv.com slash megacast. Well, we know that over the past several years with uh, school being both in person and being virtual and uh, with, with uh, school be, uh, and, and with all the impacts that that has had on our classroom, on our teachers, on our students as well, that it's certainly affected academics, not only in Michigan, but all across the country. We have some recent data too that's just came out on how that specifically affected students right here in Michigan. And joining us to talk about 
Uh, those numbers, as well as what school districts across the state and superintendents across the state in particular are doing to counteract some of those lasting effects of the pandemic on our education system is Dr. Tina Kerr, the executive director of the Michigan Association of Superintendents and Administrators on today's edition of the MechaCast. Dr. Kerr, thanks for being with us again. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, good to have you with us. Uh, so, uh, of course, we know the, that COVID-19 has had a major impact on schools across the U.S. and across the nation. We've talked in the past about uh, the disparities and some of those effects uh, from those issues on schools and in, in lower income areas. But across the state, some very staggering numbers we uh, just last week had uh I had discussed on this on this program and in our headline segment an article from uh, Isabel Lohman and Mike Wilkinson at Bridge Michigan about the recent release of uh, NAEP numbers or National Assessment of Educational Progress numbers from 2019 uh, through this year that show that Michigan's uh, test scores, in particular in reading and math, uh, fell to their sorry in reading fell to their lowest scores in over 30 years. That's quite a staggering number. And certainly you think about the, the impacts of the varying changes in the school systems over the course of the pandemic as being a primary culprit for all that. So let's start with where teachers and with administ where, where administrators are at at this moment in time as we're uh, in, about in the middle of the school year, approaching the middle of the school year here in the state of Michigan, well into, uh, well into it, all of our schools back fully in person with some, of course, still having some other options as well for, for students and families uh, that would prefer not to be in that in-person classroom. But by and large, where are our schools at in terms of getting back into the fold of things and, and uh, you know, re really bringing these classrooms back to a more traditional in-person learning environment, but also adjusting for what they've learned over the last couple of years? Sure, thanks, Tyler. Um, well, all our schools started this fall with the intent to come back face-to-face -face and in person. But as you said, some of our districts found that some students did learn um, effectively with a virtual option. So you're seeing some hybrid opportunities in districts, but for the most part, our schools began the school year back in person, still trying to keep in mind those safety precautions because obviously COVID is still uh, lurking around, but Certainly, I think that there was a new uh, optimism and hope for the start of this school year. Yeah, and that optimism and hope, a, a lot of that also comes from where we were at with our learning and with our education system here in the state of Michigan pre-pandemic. We talked about those NAEP numbers and some of those staggering faults and, and those numbers over the last three years between 2019 and, and 2022. But before that, in the three years prior, Michigan showed considerable improvement in those NAEP testing scores uh, compared to the rest of the nation too. So there was something that was really positive going on in our classrooms pre-pandemic uh, that hopefully is going to be coming back and, and continues to be coming back uh, and having an effect as we go forward. On, on the administrative level, what do you do as a superintendent or as an administrator, particularly as you're looking at, uh, the, at, at the controversies of, of uh, learning loss and certainly these numbers from these testing these testing uh, institutions that help to kind of be a little bit of a guidepost throughout the year and, and year to year uh, in terms of you know, sort of bridging those gaps while you're also continuing on with this learning at a normal rate. There's kind of three big, um, I think I'd call them buckets that administrators are working through. The first of which is just academic recovery strategies. I don't like to call it learning loss. We like to call it delayed learning uh, because the pandemic did delay the learning that was occurring in classrooms due to the virtual options or other mitigating circumstances. The second piece is the needed legislative action. And we as an association are very focused on that. And then I would say the third part is really the reality of what we're dealing with in regards to the educator shortage in our state. That certainly has had a dramatic impact, especially when you talk about our scores improving previous to the pandemic. As we saw the pandemic come, we did see a decline again in our qualified educators that we had supporting our students. So we're going to focus on how do we work on those three things to help um, increase student learning and recover from this delayed learning that occurred during the pandemic. 
Is, is that something that you and that other superintendents across the state of Michigan uh, that are associated with MASA believe that can be done in a rather uh, expedient matter, manner? Because on the one hand, you're trying to make up for uh, you know, some of that delayed learning that occurred as a result of the constraints of the pandemic, whether it be virtual learning or outside circumstances and, and concerns that were faced not only here in Michigan, but across the country and across the world, but at the same time, not necessarily you know, rushing to play, to play catch up on this education at the same time, which can also have a significant effect on the kids' education and the quality of their learning. Sure. Um, we're kidding ourselves to think that this might happen overnight. Um, it certainly won't. It is going to take a, a long period of time. And some of the things that we're looking at are going to need time to actually show their impact. The one thing I will say that's been in our favor as we think about these recovery strategies, a lot of our districts, uh, thanks to us receiving $6 billion in federal funding to help students and staff recover from the pandemic, a lot of those funds are being used for uh, uh, investment in high intense tutoring programs. We're seeing extended summer schools, which usually help us deal with summer school loss, but now can also help us uh, move forward with the delayed learning that happened during the pandemic. And then we're seeing a lot of districts that are creating their own grow your own programs. Um, we had another 12 million that was invested in creating these programs to get parapros that may want to be uh, classroom teachers and moving people through the ranks quicker, but with a high quality education. So that again, as you said, we don't want to do anything to set us back academically. We are constantly trying to move forward and give the supports that we need in the classroom. We're joined by Dr. Tina Kerr. She is the executive director of the Michigan Association of Superintendents and Administrators or MASA joining us on today's edition of the Megacast. You can learn more information about MASA as well as find some of the resources, advocacy, uh, and, and upcoming events as well by going to their website, gomasa.org, G-O-M-A-S-A.org for more information, G-O-M-A-S-A or gomasa.org for more information. And, and we mentioned I mentioned this a little bit earlier. It's important that we circle back to this, uh, Dr. Kerr. As you're considering all these different mitigation efforts and, and um initiatives in order to bridge some of those gaps in the, in the delayed learning in our classrooms. Uh, it, I would imagine it's that much tougher to do that in a school district that's in a lower income area, a higher poverty area that already had been previously before the pandemic, suffering for resources from the state and the federal government as well to provide some of these services. Of course, you got a lot of a lot of the federal funding that came through to schools as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as from the state, certainly going to be helpful in that regard. But what are organizations like yours doing to help those school districts that are in uh, areas of most need academically and from a resources standpoint, even pre-pandemic, to bridge some of these gaps when they do have significantly fewer resources than those school districts and those students in more affluent areas? I will say I'm, I, I agree with you, Tyler, that that has been an ongoing when we talk about resources. We have long been advocates for leveling the playing field as far as financially for students. In this past summer's unprecedented education budget, you saw funding start to go to those subgroups that needed more attention and needed more resources, such as our ELL, our high poverty areas, our special education, et cetera. So, I do feel like we've made significant gains to have the funding follow the needs of the child in those uh, districts. But as an association, certainly one of the things we continue to do is, is by servicing over 95% of the superintendents in Michigan, we are always looking for ways to ensure that that learning that occurs at the association level for the superintendents is directly imp has an impact in their particular district setting, whether it be small rural, or urban suburban, we want to try and um, make sure our professional development opportunities meet them where their needs are. Again, we're joined by Dr. Tina Kerr, the Executive Director of the Michigan Association of Superintendents and Administrators on today's edition of the Megacast. You can find more information on all of their work by visiting gomasa.org, go M-A-S-A. Dot org for more information, including their, their partners, some advocacy work, resources, on COVID-19, uh, job postings across the state, workshops, and more. 
GoMassa.org, as well as our, our calendar for the upcoming events as well. Dr. Kerr, in terms of uh, the educator standpoint, we, uh, of course, your organization working with superintendents and administrators, but under them in, in the chain of command, are those, front, those people on the front lines in our classroom each and every day teaching our kids and helping to enact these different plans and, and different initiatives to bridge those gaps uh, in, in um, the delayed learning all across the state of Michigan. So what more needs to be done at the administrative level? Or are you suggesting for administrators and certainly superintendents, A, to attract new talent right here in the state of Michigan, but also to retain those excellent, uh, excellent members of their staff and their faculty in their facilities and keep them in the industry where we've seen over the past few years, many, many very talented employees and, uh, and educators across the state due to the stresses of that job, the constraints of that job and the situation that we're in educationally here in Michigan and across the country have left the profession altogether. Uh, that's absolutely correct. And there's a lot of factors that obviously added to that. Um, what we're trying to do uh, is support our administrators as they work to alleviate the stress that educators are under. We talked about students' health and well being during the pandemic, but just as important has been the staff and the educators, as you said, on the front lines, their health and well being. You're seeing a lot of districts that are implementing. Uh, trying to implement more on-site wellness programs, trying to ensure that their staff have safe outlets to go and have conversations. But we're also seeing, again, with the educator shortages plaguing our state and the nation, um, we're having to look at other opportunities, how to attract people to the profession. Uh, quality, competitive wage, certainly, as you said, those supports that are in place to ensure that they have a positive culture and can have a positive impact in the classroom. Uh, we've seen our governor and our legislature are certainly trying to put money to attract more people to the profession, but it's also up to each community to, to make a difference in those schools. And while the administrators can control so much, it's certainly about does a teacher come to a district or a community and do they feel like they're at home? And a lot of the stresses that have happened that we've seen politically on a national level have certainly trickled down into the communities in Michigan. So again, it's imperative that we all work together to ensure that our educators in our schools feel safe, feel valued, feel protected, and that they can earn a, a decent living to support the students that are in their classrooms. Yeah, teaching, educating is a partnership between those educators and the families, as well as the students, uh, administrators, and superintendents as well. It's all one big partnership at the community level. So community involvement always going to be critical in all these matters, especially with the challenges we face today. Dr. Kerr, thank you so much for joining us. I appreciate it. Thank you, and have a great day. You as well. Go Massa.org for more information and resources, as well as upcoming events with professional development opportunities for teachers and school districts all across the state in a variety of different capacities and on a variety of different topics. Go Massa.org. That will do it for this Thursday edition of the Megacast. Of course, you can always tune in live Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. until 11 o'clock across our network, civiccentertv.com slash Megacast. For all that information on our partnering stations and to find us on demand as well if you can't tune in 10 to, to 11 every single day. CivicCenterTV.com slash MechaCast. Head over to our local news page as well for up-to-date COVID-19 information at the federal level from the CDC, the statewide level from the MDHHS, and locally where we originate our broadcast in Oakland County from the Oakland County Health Division. Of course, big thank you to our crew, Jared Clark and Calvin Brown at the studio of My Michigan TV uh, for, for uh, making this program possible each and every day. To our guests for joining us and to you for tuning in. That's it for today's program. Stay tuned. We'll be back very soon with a new episode.